Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Tonight's topic is entitlement. What I'm excited about with this topic is that we're going to combine it with some ideas about narcissism. It might just be my timeline on social media, but I see so much posting about narcissism and borderline these days. And although I've done a couple of broadcasts specifically on those topics, I want to start to talk about it and weave it in to what we're talking about today with entitlement. And what you're not going to be surprised by this evening is the fact that entitlement in a child is a, a signal that we have some work to do, that there's something for us to do to, to shift, to change perspective, behaviors, and so forth. And our, our view that our child is entitled or the, the fact that our child might appear entitled with their behavior and in their attitudes, again, it signals to us that something's going on with us. We think about entitlement as a, as a kind of self-centeredness and a, a, a spoiledness. But when we look at it through the therapy lens, and this is what I want to say most importantly throughout the, the, the broadcast this evening, is that um, entitlement is often an indication that a parent's lack of self or underdeveloped self is at play. And I, I've, I've spent so much time in my career um, talking about, teaching about on these broadcasts, the writing that I do, uh, about how important it is to contain. And I'll continue that discussion for the rest of my career, I'm, I'm sure, and I'll talk about it more tonight, about how important it is to have the capacity to contain somebody, to hold space for them, to view them through compassion, compassion and eyes and curiosity. I think what I've neglected to, to indicate or to discuss is this idea that, that it's built on a foundation of self. I had a client recently refer to the Buddhist, you know, through the Buddhist perspective, through the Buddha, seeing their, their spouse like the Buddha would see them. And this is something that they've been cultivating over many years, to be able to see in a moment of conflict or distress the most compassionate perspective of their child or of their spouse. And what I said was, first of all, I complimented their, their idea to be able to have that capacity and that compassion. But I said, remember what the Buddha would do or, or the Christ or whatever, uh, whatever, whoever you look up to in your life. Remember that the first thing that they would do is they would take time for themselves. They would go and they would meditate. They would go and they would pray, whatever their self-care routine is. Maybe it's just taking a time out so that they had the capacity to show up with compassion. And so this is going to be a little bit maybe challenging to some of the interpretations of what I've, of what I've taught over the year, but to show up in a moment, in a conversation from a place of should or shouldn't, instead of a place of, of can or can't. If we show up to a conversation or to a relationship or to a situation because of should or shouldn't energy, then we often end up abusing the other person or, or hurting ourselves very deeply. So as we think about the self-centered child, the, the narcissistic child, the entitled child, the foundation the, the, that everything is built upon is the foundation of a healthy self in the parent. So that we, when we show up with our needs, with our horrible rotten self, my therapist has been telling me a lot of stories lately about where she's kind of blown up at her, her grandchildren, kind of spoken sternly to her grandchildren, or she gave me some examples of some professors that she admires and how they spoke to the class in a certain way. And, and at first blush, I thought, this doesn't sound like the kind of sensibility that we've been talking about for, for two decades. And what I figured out after a while, she's trying to teach me, it's okay to be you. In fact, it's imperative to be you. And within the context of you, to, to know your limitations. In other words, your child benefit when you've, developed, when you've developed or as you've developed a healthy sense of yourself because then they have to understand that there is an other present. And so many parents that I've worked with over the years through these broadcasts, through our intensives, or, or even in our wellness program, 
so many parents that I've worked with feel such a, 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 an ethos around showing up for their children with kindness, with, with love and with compassion. But what they neglect is themselves. What they neglect is that they're allowed to be themselves, to, to have limited capacity, to have limited energy, to have a, a limited ability. Entitlement is developmentally typical, right? Narcissism is what children feel like. And so the problem becomes when it, it doesn't develop, when it doesn't evolve, when it doesn't move through certain milestones. In adolescence, there is a, a, a core feature of the developmental task in adolescence around self-centeredness. They're, they're developing an identity, who they are and who they're, who they're not. And so that's a really important thing to think of or to understand that it's appropriate. And while it might be difficult to parent, I know it is, having parented three adolescents and now a fourth one right in the thick of it, I understand how challenging it can be. But our language around talking about our children being entitled often is, it's really a red herring, it's a distraction. We like to talk about the problem in the child. I know I do. We like to talk about the problem in the child so that we don't have to look at what our work in the dynamic is. And there is work for us. I talked about this in the journey of the heroic parent that the unlived life of, of a parent is a terrible burden for a child to carry. You know, sometimes I had a, a client tell me at one point that they they were told by their wilderness therapist that she, they should adopt a, a, a dog with a bunch of medical problems. And the idea was, if you can just occupy the parent with another priority that the parent deems as, as worthy of their attention, then they're going to be unavailable to the, to the child. And part of growing up is the child learning to take care of themselves. And of course, maybe more important than that, learning that they don't have to take care of the parent. So when you can learn to let your child down, to drop the ball, to come up short, to have, to at times prioritize you and your happiness and your well-being over your child's gratification, those are ways of being. And you can't manufacture it. You can't really fake it. I mean, you can once or twice, but you can't over a period of time. But when your life becomes important, or as important as your child's and at times take a prior, takes a priority, then your child starts to process that unconsciously, of course. And the unconscious process is mom and dad are unavailable. Mom and dad have the audacity to take care of themselves and to be unavailable to me. So I'm going to stop taking care of them at a more therapeutic level, we would say they, they understand that you are taking care of yourself so they don't have to. But oftentimes it's experiences, it's kind of a resentment. Like I can't believe they're not there for me. And then they end up having to take care of themselves in healthy, healthy ways. I want to, I'm going to talk for, for a good portion this evening about narcissism, but I want to explain this to you. Every human being is on the narcissistic continuum. I have yet to meet a person nor can I really even conceive of a, of a real human being, a real person, not having any narcissistic wounding. Narcissism is a result of not being seen, of not being responded to. A another aspect of it, and I'll, I'll talk about this later, is maybe being seen in the wrong way or valued in the wrong way. If we, if our, if, we experience praise and admiration for our positive qualities, but we don't have someone that can hold space for our limitations, our failures, our coming up short. That's how narcissism develops. The child understands that attention, affection, this is really important, that affection and love, they confuse it or conflate it with praise and admiration. And so they spend their life trying to be good or great or capable or talented or beautiful, right? Move, move, move the, 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 the ideas along. 
because that's the way they experience love and connection. And esteem, this is not intuitive. This is not common sense. Esteem is built out of that deeper connection and love, not out of praise and admiration. But as parents, partly because we were confused by it because it wasn't modeled or, or taught to us. Secondly, because nobody talks about this in pop psychology today. You won't, I, I rarely read anything about this in mainstream literature. So there are a couple of reasons that it happens. But we think we can infuse our children with self-esteem, with a good sense of self, with our praise and admiration. This is the key, one of the keys to the universe, actually, that the way to, to encourage esteem and a sense of self-worth is, first of all, to have your own, like I was discussing a few moments ago. But then born out of that or built on top of that, be able to see all of your children without disgust or frustration, without anger or agitation, without fear and anxiety, and to be able to hold all of them. Another thing that I see and read today so often in pop popular culture is this idea that we shouldn't need validation. That's just a simple misunderstanding of psychology and child development. It's actually insane. And we also know at the same time that we're talking about that, that children need the attention, the validation, the, the mirroring of, of a caregiver, of, of, of a parent, ideally, the functional Right, the one that, that is the, the primary caregiver, unless it's split 50-50, of course. And that out of that experience that we call attachment, a child develops a sense of worth and a sense of esteem. So the trick is not to find somebody who thinks that you're beautiful or smart or wonderful or talented, but somebody that can see all of you and see and understand your shortcomings with compassion. That's the original source of esteem. And if it wasn't earned, as we say, in your development, that is something that we can earn later with a sponsor, with a support group, with, a, with an adequate therapist, or even a, a really adequate friend. Another idea is that gratitude, um, this idea about how to foster gratitude. Um, the simplest thing that I can say on tonight's broadcast is this. The idea is to encourage all of our children's feelings. And some are harder to hear than others. But when we let our children feel all of their feelings, their sadness, their frustration, their anger, even when it's, or maybe even especially when it's directed toward us, the gratitude will come along with it. And so some people can swear by the idea of focusing on gratitude, of focusing on, on, on things that we have, not taking for, for granted. And I think that can be helpful. It's it's a it's really a practice in mindfulness. But but day to day, often the way to encourage gratitude is to let a child be upset, let them be frustrated, let them be disappointed, let them be angry. And believe me, I, I know that's uh, tremendously easier to say than to do. But but that's not the point of these broadcasts. These point of these broadcasts aren't for me to dispel notions to tell you how to be perfect. The point of the broadcast is to talk about what the project is. And, and what are the, the barriers as we work out our project? Like I said, entitlement, other words, uh, can fit. entitlement is, is something that we say to shame children to, so that we don't have to work on facing our boundaries, setting boundaries. It's, a, it's another label to call or refer to the other and their shortcomings so we don't have to consider us and our shortcomings. Entitlement, again, is a signal of, of a parent's lack of self, a parent who bends too much, a parent who feels guilty about setting boundaries. And I'm going to talk about some of the insults that are, that are thrown at parents, and I, I hope you stay tuned for that. I, th I think that's really important also. So it, it's about a parent who feels the guilt and the shame when their child's needs go unmet. And you know, I, I talk and teach all the time about how not only shame is, is harmful and destructive, but guilt is also. It's not an indication of morality or our, our moral North Star, but the guilt that we feel when our child is struggling or suffering. It's valuable to, to 
for it to get our attention, for us to ask questions, but to respond to it as if it's telling us the truth about the situation can be harmful. And so because of a parent's shame and guilt, their inability to say no, to set boundaries, to let a child struggle, which again, are, are, are all based in and on a parent's sense of self and the work that they've done, all of that feeds into this recipe of, of developing what we call in our culture entitlement or entitled children. It is our responsibility, like I've said, to respond with patience, non-judgment, curiosity, and kindness, and, and I think I've undertaught this, although in the audacity to be you, it's why the first chapter is on finding yourself first. And it's our responsibility to practice self-care so that we can do these things. And, and what if we can't? Well, the answer is all of us struggle with it at some level. Everything that I talk about, when I, when I do a broadcast and I'm thinking about boundaries, not only do I draw upon my, my study and my education, but I draw upon what's it like for me? What are the barriers that stand in the way? Also, I have the unique and special perspective of watching other people, clients work this out, families work this out over years so I can share with you what they've shared with me. So the most important work is your boundaries. The most important work is taking care of yourself. And remember, I know I say this all the time, but some people will tune in to this podcast not having heard anything that I say, but boundaries are the edges of, your, of, of you, of the self, of what you like, what you love, what you dislike, what you can tolerate, what you're capable of, what you prefer. So boundaries are not about changing other people, although they do do that. Boundaries are about taking care of yourself. And why don't we do that effortlessly? It's because our parents told us that we were selfish. Because when, our, when we weren't caring for others, we were taught by our parents, our teachers, the adults in our lives, that we weren't considering others. And we weren't just told us in, in, in places where we were acting out. We were told the, those things in places where we just weren't prioritizing somebody else's needs above our own. So, so like so much of what we talk about, this work, the evoke work is to unlearn most everything that i'm talking about is unlearning what what we've been taught by the people that have come before us and having to kind of write our own story figure out who we are and what does it mean to love somebody else because as simple as that those two phrases sound learning what it means to be us to be a person to be a human being and then secondly, how to love, what love really looks like. We weren't taught that, not in the deep, profound ways that we explore during these broadcasts. Our wounds, our stuff, our guilt, our shame, our fear, our anxiety. I talk about in the audacity to be you very clearly that, that, that the euphemism that I often hear people use when talking about the love that a parent has, the anxiety that a parent has for a child, They'll talk about that, that anxiety being akin to too much love. You know, you're, you're loving too much. Your ability, your inability to tolerate your child's distress, to not give them answers. Your inability to do that is too much love. When really it's about not enough self. See, if we have self, we have low anxiety. And then when things don't seem to be going as they should or as planned, we know that we're going to be okay. And we respond very thoughtfully. In cognitive terms, in brain terms, we're, we're able to take the high road. Not because it's morally better or superior, but because it refers to the top and the front parts of the brain that are active when we're not triggered in our fight or our, our fight response. We're able to think through things. We're able to have what, what, what biologists and neurologists call neuroflexibility, or excuse me, uh, response flexibility, which also is kind of a neuroflexibility. 
we can respond, respond thoughtfully. It's critical and really subtle, nuanced work to separate out praise and admiration from love and connection. I've already talked about that. But so often we confuse the two. I've told you the story a couple of times uh, of a parent who was anxious after writing their child the first letter in our program. A, a loving letter, but but a difficult letter to read at times because it lists the, the, the reasons why the child was sent to our program. And this parent feeling anxious as, as one might feel after writing such a tough letter, the next week wrote back a letter of 25 reasons why I love you, or, or reasons why I, 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 yeah, 25 reasons why I love you. And then listed all these positive qualities. And after reading it, I asked the young man, I said, how'd you feel about this letter? And he said, okay, I guess. And I said, it, it sounds kind of needy to me. Like, I don't think that was for you. I think that was for your parent, not for you. And you can see him relax, his face relaxed, his eyes got wider and brighter. The energy came back to him and he said, I wasn't feeling right about it, but that makes so much sense. And to, to the parents' credit, when I went and gave them that report that week in our weekly phone call, they owned it immediately. And actually, it was 50 reasons, not 25. I just always tell it as 25 because 50 sounds unbelievable, but it was 50. So, so part of, of, of entitlement, this is going to be a tough couple of sentences I'm about to, to utter here. Part of entitlement and, and, and a narcissistically delayed child is because of the unhealed narcissism in the parent. Because we need to be good. And the child needs to give us that feedback, right? Feed that back to us. Because we're asking them for something that we didn't get from our parents. And none of this is conscious. If you're new to these broadcasts, you might be listening to me and thinking, he's crazy or I'm not even sure what he's saying. I've heard that more times than I can count. But the fact of the matter is, that's the anatomy of this process. Parents pass on their narcissistic wounding because they haven't done the work to unravel them. And by the way, narcissism can look grandiose and arrogant, but it can also look depressed and anxious. We talk about the malignant or the grandiose narcissist a lot but there are, are more anxious, insecure, and depressed narcissists, I think, than there are the grandiose type. So if, if we think that, that uh, being a good mom and being a good dad makes us worthy of love, of God's love, of the world's love, of, of our parents' love, then we'll pass on that same idea to our child or to our children. So again, when the child looks entitled, looks narcissistic, looks spoiled, it's a signal that there's some deeper work for us to do. I love the drama of the gifted child, like I always tell you, and, and this is this idea comes from, from, from Alice Miller in writing that book. She said, oftentimes we're just needing from our children unconditional love because that's ideally some form of that or close to that is ideally what we would have gotten from our parents. At the end of the day, every child has dents, every child has, has, has bruises. I'm speaking figuratively, of course, about dents and bruises. And, and, and that includes us and that includes our children. And eventually those dents and those bruises and those issues become ours. Or, or, or theirs to work out. I think by the time they get to our program, yes, it's fantastic if you're involved in these broadcasts and listening and doing your work. It's wonderful. I thank you. I, I appreciate it. I'll tell you it makes a world of difference to your child and to their work and to your, your lives together going forward. 
And at the same time, by the time that they get to us, there's a message inherent in the work that we do with them that says, yes, it happened. I'm not going to minimize that or you tell, tell you to get over it. I'm going to listen to it. But even in my listening, there will be a message of, you've got to work this out. It's yours now. Yes, your mom or your dad or your teacher or your peers have done those things to you or the media, on and on. And now they're yours to work out and to sort out. And, and how do you best teach that to them? It's not by lecturing. Don't repeat what I'm saying tonight. I told you that last time. This is not about repeating what an expert says to the people in your life. But the, 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 the take home from this line of thinking is that you have to learn to take care of yourself. That's how you show them to take care of themselves. And when we say to them, you're the reason I can't sleep, you're the reason I can't eat, you're the reason I can't find peace and serenity, we are modeling for them that other people are in control. So we own our feelings, ideally. I told you the, the I've told you the story a couple of times about the, the, the codependent mom, or it was asked for and in behalf of the codependent mom. A professional asked me while I was speaking, how dare I have the, the gall and the ignorance to suggest to, to a, a mother in this case that somebody was discussing that she kick her child out of the house at 20 or 21 as this particular child is addicted to, to opiates and that the potential is that the child could die from it. And I stopped and, and apologized if I would misspoken. I said, let me be very clear. I don't tell mothers or fathers to set those kind of boundaries, ideally ever. But what I do is I help the parent, in this case, the mother, heal her codependency. And then she knows what to do. And I don't. I don't. So, so the work is your work. The problem is not the child's entitlement. That's just a signal that something needs attention, something needs focus. But that's not the problem. If that was the problem, then we would maintain the same course of thinking that created the problem, that it is the child's issue that I need to resolve so that I feel better. As Emma Reedy, who works for Evoke and also happens to be my daughter, said, codependency is the illusion that we're taking care of somebody else when we're really taking care of ourselves. Indulgence in a child doesn't quite explain it. In fact, I think this is another way of shaming parents. I, I told you I would comment on this. I think we insult parents with phrases and terms like helicopter parent and snowplow parent and hovering parent. And I think we do that in society because we're, we're judging people just like we've been judged, right? But I, it's just a parent's wound. Whatever I'm talking about today that, that I'm suggesting that needs attention in your life, that is being signaled by a behavior in your child, I'm talking about your wounding, about your big T or, or probably more likely your small T trauma. And why would I insult you with clever names when really what you're, you're exhibiting is just the product of your own woundedness and your own trauma? I would, in essence, be perpetuating the exact thing that caused it in the first place. And therapists do this. Psychologists and treatment professionals do this. They insult you. They get impatient with you. They get frustrated with you. They do it because they're, number one, they're human, but probably because they haven't learned or been trained to not do it. To understand, because it's never been done to them. Because they've never sat in front of a, an empathic and capable therapist and experienced what it's like to be seen and loved, even including your horrible rotten parts. Uh, I, I talk about how the, the failure to set boundaries will often contribute to this idea of, of 
the child turning out in a certain way. And even my teaching has been interpreted this way. Um, again, all of the child's behavior is a, a, an opportunity to ask yourself questions. And you are the answer. Your life, your way of being is the answer. Like I said, we, we all have narcissistic wounding. When somebody reaches a certain, certain threshold of developmental de delays or, or behavior, they qualify for the diagnosis of a narcissist, but this is not as, as universal as we think. But the narcissistic continuum is universal. I wrote, in fact, I didn't include it in this, these, this presentation tonight. I wasn't planning on, on saying this, but I wrote several months ago that most children are gaslighted by their parents. Most parents gaslight their children. And I've done it more than I would like to admit. Still struggle with it today. I mean, remember, I'm trained in this stuff. This is how I think and what I think about every day, all day. And I still do it. So it's happening. I hear it at the grocery store. I hear it at a restaurant. I hear it at family gatherings. Let alone my, my, my treatment spaces, right? The intensives and the wilderness spaces. I hear staff do it. I hear therapists do it. And we do it because we don't want the badness to reside in us. We don't want to have to address our own trauma. We don't have to want to have to look at our dents and wounds. And we're carrying along, along the generational cycle and holding our parents' ego and carrying it around for them holding the idea in our head that they, they're good parents or they were well-intentioned and that those two ideas, them being good parents and well-intentioned, prevent us from being angry or sad or disappointed, from being ourselves. I know this sounds strange and it might not sound intuitive again, but the way that we think about therapy and attachment-based therapy, which Evoke is based on, is the goal is to become who you are your most authentic self. Some people call it a higher self, and I, I, I'm i okay with that, but I just like authentic or real self. Because I don't want to layer this, this moral hierarchy onto it. But your authentic self is generous, and it's a child. It's the purity of a child. It's childlike. It's honest, it's loving. It's in the pure sense, it's, it's unwounded, right? It's who you are. So we have unprocessed and unhealed trauma to work through. But because we haven't done our work or we're still working on it or we haven't gotten there, we acted on our, on our child. It doesn't come from indulgence, although there might be a single signal. It doesn't come from permissiveness although that might be a signal. Remember, the basis of entitlement is not enough self in the parent, which shows up as indulgent and permissive because the parent is seeking any port in the storm, at least, but, but probably more so, the experience of being seen as a good parent, particularly by the child. And if our child is upset or anxious or sad or hurt, especially if we possibly have something to do with it or could prevent it, we internalize that as something's wrong with us because that's what our parents taught us. That when we upset them, we were the wrong one. When we made them worried, we were bad. It's wired into us also, but it's also reinforced in the family culture. When we disappointed our parents, that was supposed to be a signal to us that we did something wrong. So that's a narcissistic wound. That when we made our parents proud, we were good. Which of course isn't true at all. It's only coincidental. So anxious parenting is what is present. A lack of self in the parent. I hear this phrase so often, parents are well-intended, but I will tell you that is 
almost always in the in the context of gaslighting a child. I read something recently where, in fact, I shared it on my social media. Something somebody else had written it that said that you know, especially with mothers, we have this tender place for for, for mothers for our mothers. And it said something like that if you you know if you said to your friends that your dad abused you, everybody would get behind you and say, of course, of course he did, and we're behind you. But if your mother uh, abused you, a common refrain from from friends would be, well, she really loved you. She was really well intended. I've heard adults my age describe abusive behavior by their parents in the here and now and qualifying it by their well-intended. And my response is they're not well-intended. They're just anxious, which is not bad or good. It's just anxious, right? Lack of a self is not bad. It's just a lack of a self. Struggling and suffering with an anxious attachment style is not bad. It's just struggling with an anxious attachment style. But we just don't know how to get these words bad and good out of our head because we think that's the only thing that's going to keep us on the straight and narrow path. And it's not. It's going to prevent our growth and our healing. So I don't use the phrase well-intended, especially at our intensives, because I hear that a lot. And when I hear somebody say well-intended, I'll often challenge it and say they weren't well-intended. They were just scared, which is just fear. And out of that place of fear, they acted the way that they did. Out of that place of anxiety, they acted the way that they did, which is not good or bad. It's just driven by anxiety and by fear and deserves our attention and, and our and our healing energy. When we are praised and admired for the things that we do, when we are told that that when we do good that our children are that our parents are proud of us, and when we are do do bad that our, our parents are disappointed in us, and we internalize that at all, then we make a connection between our worth and our accomplishments. And like I talk about in the journey of the rogue parent, maybe the most seminal comment that I write in the entire book, it's how you hold the child in your mind is going to be how the child thinks of themselves. So if the child is a, is a problem or is the problem, if a child is broken, the child will experience themselves as a problem and broken. So we have to do self-care, right? We have to meditate, pray, go to Al-Anon and CODA and AA groups, go to therapy, read self-help books, listen to podcasts, and learn. We have to be fed spiritually and emotionally, get a full belly so that we can come back to our children, to the people that we love, and be there for them. We have to take care of ourselves first over there so that we, when we come here and interact with the child or with the other that we care about, that we love, we can be there for them. We come to our marriage happy. We don't look for our partner to make us happy. We go and get happy. And then we come to our marriage happy. And we ask, how can I support you? How can we walk our independent journeys together in love and support? And again, it's born out of our attachment traumas, our attachment healing, our attachment style. Nobody had a perfect one. In the literature, it says something around 60% or so of individuals in, in, in America uh, have a, a secure attachment. I don't know how they're measuring that. I don't know where that information is. Because I can walk down my street and listen to people talking on their front porches. And I'm going to hear examples of anxious attachment and avoiding attachment and disorganized attachment all over the place. So again, like everything in mental health, the labels can be helpful to understand, but it's really a continuum. Mental health is a continuum, and we're all on it somewhere. It's a mask for, for the, the emptiness and, and the dread and the fear of not belonging, of not fitting in, of not having a place. And our response to the entitled kid or the narcissistic individual is to cut them down to size, which, of course, is the exact opposite of what will heal them. Now, I should say, Narcissists who qualify for the diagnosis are very difficult to treat. 
And very often they go untreated. They're often very successful. So they don't require treatment. The depressed narcissist and the anxious nar narcissist, they show up very often in therapy, actually. But the grandiose and the malignant narcissist oftentimes don't. But when we see them in popular culture, we want to attack them. Because again, it's so off-putting. It triggers in us th that response instead of the response which would be ideal, which is to have compassion and to see them as scared and secure children. This is from an article that I wrote, a blog that I wrote. I'm just going to read it to you. Narcissism is not a result of being overvalued. Instead, narcissism is the result of valuing the wrong thing in the child or valuing the child in the wrong way. To put it another way, the child is not valued. Technically, it might be impossible to overvalue a child, but we can value them for the wrong reasons, such as valuing them for being good or being the easy one or the happy child. Many children experience praise and adoration for their accomplishments or giftedness, and they interpret that as love and attention. It feels like it approximates love and attention. In the recent Academy Award-winning movie, Inside Out, the main character was referred to by her parents as our happy little girl. After several disheartening events in her life, the young girl experienced and displayed a sad and morose emotional state. Subsequently, due to the lack of empathic capacity, her parents interpreted this as disrespect rather than a valid emotional response given the circumstances. When we are valued, for things such as our talents, our intelligence, our obedience, our compliance, our happiness, essentially we are not seen by others. Alice Miller from the drama The Gifted Child talked about the need to cut the connection between being admired and being loved when she said, without therapy, and I should add, without adequate therapy. Without therapy, it is impossible for the grandiose person to cut the tragic link between admiration and love. The grandiose person, Alice Miller goes on to say, is never really free. First, because he is excessively dependent on admiration from others. And second, because his self-respect is dependent on qualities, functions, and achievements that can suddenly fail. So that's why it's so important to have this containing idea in mind. And define a container for you. Again, I, I could talk about this for hours. But the experience that I've had of sitting across from an empathic other for 25 years, a therapist, excuse me, for 22 years, means that I can sit with myself. Then instead of hating my symptoms, when my narcissism bubbles up, when my arrogance bubbles up, when I try to get attention by telling people in the world socially, look at me, look at all the things I've done. Instead of hating those attributes and characteristics of myself, which I was taught to do, I'm able to pause to be a little bit more quiet and to listen and connect to the scared child who fears that he won't be loved that he won't fit in, and that he won't be welcome. So when you become a self, when you do this healing, when you become grounded, when you have some success at dealing with and treating your anxiety, when you can be present with your child in the ways that I'm describing, entitlement starts to go away starts to diminish, starts to extinguish. When your needs are at play, when you need to be good, when you're afraid to set a boundary, when you say yes, yes instead of saying no out of guilt or no instead of saying yes out of guilt or fear, you create a, a, a mirror that shows you how and where you were harmed. 
Only narcissists do this. We like to create a safe distance between us and the disturbed. We like to think. We like to think that the crazy people out there, right? The narcissists out there, the bad people are out there. Not in here. Um, we like to think of narcissists as these unique animals instead of us being kind of like them. We like to think of it as a conscious manipulation instead of an unconscious wound being acted out and hurting all the people around them. Narcissists are suffering. And we have what, what I call a, a kind of a pseudo stupidity where we pretend not to understand them. We pretend not to understand Darth Vader when we, we go around acting like him all the time. We pretend not to act like the villains in our movies and our stories. I wrote recently that the idea and when watching fairy tales or, or, or Disney cartoons, that the idea is not to tell a child to identify with the hero, but really to identify with all of the characters. Like when my son was five, he said to me, and I don't know how he made this leap. I'm, I'm incredibly happy that he did. But he was about five years old when he turned to me, maybe four. We were watching Disney's Peter Pan. And he said to me, Peter Pan's not bad, right, Dad? Peter Pan's, just, or excuse me, he said, Captain Hook isn't bad, right? He's just sad. And I said, yeah, he's just sad. He's not bad. Um, I'm not just talking about treatment parents. And I'm not exonerating people of their own accountability. It just takes courage to understand how we might be participating in a dynamic. It takes courage and, and really uh, some success with battling shame and guilt to be able to understand that we are contributing to a dynamic that we dislike, that we complain about. The ability to mourn, Alice Miller tells us, gives us back our vitality when we can do our family of origin work. I reposted today on my Instagram somebody who said that you can't really solve so many fights and conflicts and relationships go unsolved because What's happening, what's at play is the unconscious work and the unhealed wounds from childhood. And then somebody wrote to me and said, well, then what do we do? She's a therapist, the person who wrote to me. And I said, we go back to the original context. We sort it out there. You come to a, a finding you to an intensive. You read the books. You listen to the podcasts, right? You read the drama of the gift of child from the perspective of you as a child, not you as a parent. Alice Miller wrote that this healing is not a homecoming since this home has never before existed. It's the creation of a home, she says. The child must adapt to ensure the illusion of love, care, and kindness, but the adult does not need this illusion to survive. We learn self-care. And that's why single parents are at a disadvantage. That's why co-parents who aren't on the same page are disadvantaged because you, you from the get-go, from the start, you have half the resources. So the temptation for single parents or for parents of, of, of families where co-parenting is not working together is that you want the child to get more and more in line. And we label them with phrases and words like entitled so that we don't have to do our work. And you do have a battle in front of you. And if you're a single parent or the parent of a co of a co-parenting system that's not working, you do have a battle that you're fighting with one hand tied behind your back. Probably the greatest wounds, probably the greatest wound is not to have been loved just as we are. You know what's amazing about this? Sometimes when I teach this work of self, People will tell me, you know, you're, you're advocating for selfishness. It's hard to explain it. I just thought that the best example of this ever is Mr. Rogers. 
If you haven't yet, watch the, the, the two movies that came out a few years ago. He wasn't selfish. But he had good boundaries and he had enough healthy self-care, enough, he, enough healing that he could help children heal and feel and move through whatever they were feeling. And like, like somebody's quote that I recently read said, unless you're, and I'm going to not use the word that they use because I guess some people might find it offensive. Actually, I'm going to use the word that they used because if you're listening to this podcast, you, you're probably not very delicate. The quote that I read said, if you're not an asshole, if you're not the asshole in somebody else's story, you're probably not doing good work on your boundaries. That's the antidote for entitled children is to become an asshole in their story. A selfish, stupid, old fashioned, rigid, ridiculous parent. And to have enough sense of self that when you get called that you're not thrown off. You're not ungrounded. You're not lost. Alice Miller went on to say, when we realize that all of our lives we have feared and struggled to ward off something that cannot really happen any longer, it has already happened at the very beginning of our lives when we are completely dependent. You know, I've seen entitled children come to our program. And I've responded to them as it has our have our staff in a different way than they were responded to at home. This isn't say that I can do it easily as a father. I want to be very, very clear. Working with those people in the other part of my house is a much taller challenge than working with your child. That's part of the gift and the blessing of programs like Evoke Therapy programs, is that we can do something easier than you for your children. Just like a lot of you could do something more objectively and clearly for my children than I could at times. That's true both ways. So I'm not on some pedestal looking down. We're all in this together. But I see children. I see what they say to me as their therapist when I've been their therapist or to the staff or to each other. You don't care. You're being unfair. And the list goes on and on. And, and what they are telling me is they're telling me about their parents' wound. When a child says, you don't love me, when that's their go-to manipulation, for, for lack of a better word, I would say maybe, maybe more compassionately, when that's their best attempt to get their needs met is to call me unloving, their therapist, I then know what their parents are struggling with. Their parents are struggling with a wound that tells them that they're not loving parents. It's like the anxious father said to me, like, you know, he did everything almost to the point where I had to say to them, you're going to have to learn to trust me or you're going to have to leave the program because I can't give you this much attention. He was asking for daily updates, sometimes twice a day that first week. And I finally said, you have to, I'm not mad at you. I understand it. This is a hard transition, but you're either going to have to trust us or you're going to have to take your child out because I, I just can't do it. My staff can't do it. He ended up coming out to the field and visiting another group. Actually, ironically, he didn't know this at the time, but he visited the group where my son was and actually talked to my son, who was working as a staff at the time. And after a day in the field visiting another group, he knew that it was the right thing for his family and for his son. So he writes his first letter to his son, and his son said to me in the session, my parents don't love me. And I listened patiently and compassionately. And I finally said to this young man at the end of that, I said, if your father, if you don't think your father loves you, I don't think you'll ever, I don't think you'll ever hear it from him. You'll ever you'll be able to feel it from you. Not only does your father love you, but he goes overboard to try to prove it all the time. So I think maybe you're just going to have to accept the fact that your experience is going to be this. And the family and the child did amazing work. We load the gun, metaphorically. Maybe it's not a great analogy, 
because of literal gun violence, but metaphorically, emotionally, psychologically, we load the weapon that that that, that our children point at us, and we 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 write on each piece of artillery the thing that we don't want to be told, and we give it to them. It's just the way relationships work. If it doesn't work, people stop doing it. If it works, they do it more. And it's not conscious. They just know and have access to our buttons. As I often say to the children in our field, in our wilderness program, my advantage is I'm not your dad and my self-esteem is not based on how you feel about me. You don't have access to the vulnerable spots the triggers, the, the, the buttons. My children do. You don't. Because I'm not really that insecure at work. I'm okay being wrong, making mistakes, being very human at work. At home, it's a battle. At home, I struggle with insecurities and fears that I'm not enough, that I'm not a good dad or a good husband or a good human. At work, not so much. So I explain to them, it won't work with me because it's okay. It's okay. You can hate me and threaten to never talk to me again because uh, I'm not relying on you to take care of me. I wish I could say the same of my children, but it's not always true. So do your work. I, you know, we have a pretty good list of attendees tonight, more than average. I wish, and I would just invite you to do your work. Come to an intensive. Do it online if you have to. You know, do it online. It's, it's cheaper. It's, it's easier. Do it somewhere. Go to therapy. Go to Al-Anon. Go to CODA. Go to groups. Listen to people that are in recovery from anxiety, from fear, from the wound of loving somebody that is hurting themselves. Listen to how they manage it, how they've managed it. Do your own work. And the literature is clear that it's not about how good your childhood was or how good you think it was, which by the way are two very different things in many cases. But your ability to parent your children and provide a healthy attachment is based on one thing primarily. How much you've worked on your childhood and made sense out of it. How, how much energy and time you've taken to take a critical look at it and sit in it and grieve. Grieve the loss of what you didn't have. Find other sources to get it that aren't your children. And then show up to your child with enough. We work on ourselves so that we can understand and be there for the other. And as you do this work, that's part of what the journey of the heroic parent is about and what my teaching is about. It's not on what you do, but it's on why you do it. It's on the why of what you do. And with some courage and some time, you'll begin to see that so much of the why is about taking care of your anxiety through somebody else, managing somebody else's behavior so that you feel safe, which by the way, is the primary motive of Darth Vader, but I won't talk about that anymore tonight. Stop shaming other people, especially children, to get them to fit inside of the box that makes you feel comfortable so that you don't have to do your work. Stop labeling parents as helicopter parents as snowplow parents, as hovering parents so that you don't have to deal with holding space and compassion for them. Work with professionals or others that can help you. I think I've made that clear. And start to see the symptoms and the wounds as related but different. If we reduce human beings, and that goes from me to you, if we reduce human beings to their behaviors, If we do that, we don't see the person. I talked to a student 
today of mine that I hadn't talked well, I've talked to a few times, but he was my student about 15 years ago or so. And we actually talked about an incident between us that might have been to the day, might have been today. He told me that he thinks it was, was within a couple of days of today. And part of it was I screwed up and part of it he was being an entitled jerk to me. And I responded in kind, by the way. Just keep doing your work. My hope from all of this is that you experience enough love and compassion from me that you want to keep looking for that. And when I was talking to my my, my former student, I was explaining to them that that we we had, we were reminisced, and I, I explained that once you see somebody, it's so easy to love them. When you really see somebody, love is inevitable. But when you can't see somebody because of your own emotional state, your own emotional well-being, your own limitations, and what you see is their symptoms or their wounds, hate, disgust, disappointment, impatience, exhaustion, anger, fear are inevitable. And this process, even for you, is about healing. Yes, I do teach on these, but I hope to communicate to you love. I hope you know that I'm in this with you. And that I, every single thing that I talk about comes from my, my own work. I couch it in the language of attachment theory and, and psychological theories and techniques and tools, but it's really just about my work. Symptoms are a signal both in us and in our child. Symptoms are a sign that there's a wound present. And if follow the, the, the trail of crumbs that the behavior leaves for us, it will lead us back to the wound. You know, one thing to be careful about with as a parent or a therapist is yes, we can we can read and we can see things that other people don't see. But don't use it all the time or don't talk about it. Act based on the information you have, but don't undress your children. Don't humiliate them. Don't tear the defense away. Don't rip the crutch out from under them. Children need their dignity and they need your boundaries and your sense of self. So use your insight to inform you, but don't use it to undress them. And in this process, we learn to honor the defenses. Looks like I'm over time. So I'm going to end tonight's broadcast with our uh, with our announcements and upcoming events and so forth and then um i'll take questions left over into the next q a the journey of the heroic parent and the audacity to be you are available on amazon and audible if you are current or former parent our next support group will be september 2nd at 6 30 p.m mountain time we are now doing an alumni session once a month so if you have to be an alumni to attend this. The next alumni support group is September 28th at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. If you are an intensives alum, the next support group is September 14th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. For questions regarding all of this or to register or to find out about them, contact Malia at evoketherapy.com. This is what I've been talking about tonight. We have intensives coming up. They're filling out months in advance. In fact, we're probably going to have to open up a second returning to you well it's already full so we are going to have to open up a second one um a second returning to you uh sometime in october the 6th the october 6th through 10th one is full and then the online one um september 23rd through 25th we do have a couple of openings for that so if you like to do some of your work and time is a factor or money is a factor or you just want the safety of doing it 
through Zoom or your computer, September 23rd. And again, contact intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information. We have virtual coaching online. Some of our intensive therapists, intensive um, coaches uh, uh, provide provide therapy for, for you. So if you're interested in getting ongoing support from people who know the Evoke way, the attachment-based therapy, contact Travis at evoketherapy.com. We have pursuits trips that are anywhere from three to 30 days for families or adults. Think therapy light, customized adventure trips all over the world. They can be in Utah or Oregon where our base of operations are, or they can be anywhere in the world for families or young adults. We ask all current parents to go to at least six 12-step support groups. We suggest for you Al-Anon CODA, Families Anonymous, or Adult Children. You can also try Refuge Recovery or NAMI.org to find classes and education and groups in your area. All of those are free. All of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You and Evoke Therapy Podcast or go to soundcloud.com. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find us uh, using the handle at Evoke Therapy or at Dr. Brad Reedy, D-R-B-R-A-D-R-E-E-D-Y, Dr. Brad Reedy. You can also find us on Instagram using at Evoke Therapy Intensives. And on Facebook, you can find us using the, the search terms Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And Travis Slagle, our, our clinical director of our intensives program, just released another wonderful blog. So go to that. It's great for those of you that might be considering an intensive or if you've attended one, you want to share it. It's a great blog to share with folks talking about the gift of therapy. The next broadcast will be September 1st. That is in two days at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. That'll be a question and answer. And then go to our website for the upcoming broadcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for on behalf of the people that, that love you and that you love. Thank you for on behalf of your children for being willing to tune in, to listen, to learn, to look at yourself. It makes a big difference. I hope this is a helpful point of contact for all of you. Take care. Have a great evening. And I'll talk to you in about 48 hours. Bye-bye.